Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Let's Play Hearts of Fire for the New Order of Germany. Let us continue on from where we last left off. So the Fuhrer is feeling pretty sick. And currently, we're going to be going down the Bormann path. I'm not too sure if we get another choice once um, the Civil War actually begins. But we'll see. We will definitely see. We can look for some opportunities. We're getting some legitimacy for Goring, Spear, and Heydrich. Currently, okay, so Hitler right now is currently in Fair Health. We have, Mo well, right now we are the most influential, which does make sense. We were the chosen successor. But will that remain the case? It, it, it's iffy. Let me just, it, it's iffy, basically. Student protest and testify. As 1962 begins to draw on and the government of the Reich re uh, remain locked in a slow stagnation, the protests by student groups across the nation about slavery, the still failed economy, the constant border with the Reich's conversats, the, about the fear of war, and about the thousands of other things raged on. With nearly a million uh, students consistently marching, protesting, drafting business, and councils other joining them, the Reich seems completely unable to cope with the crisis. While many in the government demand harsh action, nobody knows what real at harsh action they can take uh, to a movement so large and so disorganized. While threats are made against the protesters, they remain undeterred as their numbers swell. With no central authority, there is no head for the government to cut off. With the Orpo so disorganized, and with so many paramilitary groups trying to keep the peace, it has only been a wonder the situation has yet to explode. At least that was the situation until a small army of protesters began getting rowdy with a group of Orpo officers in Aachen. And a small uh, group of white officers decided to open fire on the city's armory. Or open up the city's armory and quell the unrest forcefully. Well, that I mean, that doesn't sound great. <laughs> Student revolt. Uh, the Tag des Verats is what they're calling it. They have a trail. A trail against the people of the Reich by their leaders, their police, and their military, by everybody. Police and Aachen took upon themselves and fight on a crowd of teenagers who had started a small riot outside the local Orpal station. And what started as a police shooting has sparked a massive riot across the city. Aachen is now burning as Orpal units are struggling to hold their lines against uh, furious crowds of rioters. And with the military stepping in, declaring martial law, and Orpal units ordered to stand down, large of the city have been left to the mob. The action has been limited to Aachen, with both protests and overzealous Oprah officers across the country taking up arms and inspiration. Most of the large cities of the Reich now look like a war zone, with condemnation and protest and uh, fellowship reaching as far as Moskauvin. Assuming I, how, is how you pronounce Moscow in German, Moskauvin? I know they like using pronouncing W's like V's in Germany, so I, I think that's probably right. So, we have some aircraft, don't worry about this too much. What are we missing, production? Anti-air and transport helicopters? I'm sure we're fine. I mean, we don't have any political power, but, you know, what can you do about that, really? And with no political power, I basically cannot boost Bormann's, um, Bormann support whatsoever. So the more decisions become available as Hitler's condition worsens. And do we want to secure the party first? We want to meet with the generals. I feel like meeting with the generals first makes more sense. Just in case, like, if there's a coup, I'd rather have the military on my side than opposed to us, right? Like, I think that makes sense. So, do you both give us legitimacy? Political power plus 100, army experience. I will say I prefer the political power over the army experience. But when it comes to the new order, you cannot be too sure exactly how these will actually play out. Right? Like, we could meet secure the party, get far enough down this tree, and all of a sudden the generals start to revolt against us. Or if we don't meet with the generals, the party could revolt. Something like that. It, it's... The New Order will love to just pull the rug from underneath you. Which I think is good. I like being kept on my toes. Uh, but we do have some points here, apparently. These were, uh, general economy of lost production capacity quite the last month. That's fine. The Art of Diplomacy. The cacophony of clinking glass and waves of forced laughter was giving Martin Bormann a headache. Among the 2,000 guests milling around and sitting at tables were a fair number of diplomats of both German and foreign extraction. He placed his speech notes on top of the podium with sweaty hands, surveying the room in apprehension. The, short, the speech was short and simple, admittedly a little bland. Bormann smiled to himself bitterly. He had never been able to match his striking visual imagery and a uh, wit of Gorbel's writing. At times like these, he almost missed that lecherous little rat. Gentlemen, Bormann announced into the microphone, waiting as a blanket of silence uh, gradually fell upon the crowd. The Fuhrer! He turned to his right and saluted. The guests followed suit, rising to their feet and saluting to various degrees of hastiness. Adolf Hitler shoved towards the podium and grasped it with two trembling hands. Recent events may herald the diplomatic shift in the Reich. Hitler's voice quickly faded away. Bormann's blood ran cold as Hitler looked up and eyed in the hall of confusion. Where, where's Ernst? He told me he would be here. 
Borbin strode over to the podium and placed his arm behind the fear's back, gently leading him away. The old man's body was violently quivering. I think I think it was at your wedding, Hitler exclaimed loudly as his rasping voice reverberated throughout the hall. A confused murmur erupted throughout the crowd. Are you still in the SA? Forgive me, gentlemen, Wather Hedlis exclaimed, swiftly taking the podium as Borman and, uh, and Mick led Hitler through the exit. The fear was accidentally given my speech. Allow me to continue. The real question is, uh, are there any of us still in the SA? You see, the Reich's diplomatic uh, progression can be mirrored in some way with the evolution of the SA. A disaster averted. So this condition's getting worse and worse. So we can now divert infantry equipment or strategic fort building. So what do you actually do for us? We give... We will gain 5,000 additional infantry equipment. I mean, this... Yeah. On our predicted war... Yeah, let, let's just get all this stuff. Let's get some fort building. All that sounds great. We're basically now preparing for the Civil War. And... I think we will win, or at least I hope we will win. If we end up losing, we'll just play whatever faction wins. It's not a big deal for me. A dinner, an argument, an idea. Gordon was picking at his dinner in Karna Hall. Uh, he should have been satisfied. The food was terrific. Emma was as beautiful as always, and well, those uh, priceless paintings had not yet left their grammar. Given how many he had collected since the war, he really should have been enjoying himself, if not for his guest. What we need is conquest. The thing that made us massive of Europe in the first place. Day by day, our grass in Europe grows ever more tenuous, and I shudder to think what might happen once our great fear dies. That was at least what uh, Otto Ernst Remmer said. Oh, how Goring attested that angry little man. Goring knew what he was is one of the key architects of the suicidal war plans. Well, I can tell you with great certainty that the last few decades of stewardship under our great fear have reaped nothing but dividends. I mean, we were the first to get a man to the moon. I think there are still some years left in our Third Reich. After all, are we not yet uh, close to the thousandth year? I am not right. Am I not right? Reich's Marshal Goring? Wilhelm Stucker was a longtime friend, supporter, ardent national socialist. As far as he knew, Europe was theirs, and the future of the Reich was no longer any about further conquest. Well, uh, Goring looked at Scorner's lackey before returning to his gaze towards Wilhelm Stuckert. Before he had a chance to answer, the militaries interrupted him and condemned the weak-willed bureaucrats for their ignominious policy. Stuckert, of course, did not take it sitting down and leapt up in indignation to begin what would be a shouting match between him and the ardent Skorschneider. Goring excused himself from the meal uh, to no one's notice. It would have been a waste to sign away his great popularity with the likes of Skorner and his band of merry madmen. No, destiny awaited. Surely the successor would rather, uh, was rooted, rather eager to enlist the help of none other than Herman Goring himself. Yes, there was much work to be done. As soon as he could calm the Swedes down enough to finish his dinner. So Goring, I mean, of course, we don't want Goring to... I mean, now, we do, we have 30 influence, we have moderate influence, that sounds pretty good to me. And again, Hitler, he does die in, like, October of 30, of 63, so we still have, we're, we're only in March. I, I, I think I need to stress that a little bit, where you are only currently in March of 1962. We still got a long ways to go. Dear Marm Borman, before anything else, I wish to offer you my heartfelt congratulations on securing the succession. I have no doubt that you may carry the burning torch of national socialism towards a bright and gleaming future without losing sight of what has made us a great in the first place. As such, I would like to cordially invite you to Karna Hall for dinner. I believe we have much to discuss with regards to the future of the Reich. With your firm commitment to national socialist principles and my popular support, truly no enemy, internal or external, could hope to stand a chance against our great Reich. As such, I believe I have much to offer as the administrator and officer within your faction. I hope that we meet in Karna Hall at your earliest convenience to discuss these matters for, uh, further. Warmly, General Reich Marshal Hermann Goring. Well, I mean, if we can make allies, I definitely would not say no. I'm not, because I know when the war actually begins, it's Bormann, Goring, Speer, and Heinrich. I'm not sure if he can actually get allies with any of these four, or with other, the, any of the other three, or if it's always guaranteed to be the four. We'll, we'll have to kind of, you know, wait and see. Agent Clowner Fox. Among the many agencies dedicated to rooting out the dangers of the Reich's integrity and continued supremacy, uh, none holds so much power as the Abwehr. At the top of such a large and convoluted agency, with tendrils digging deep into all offices and bureaus of the equally large German administration, a single man sits uncontested. His power is enough that he can order death without having to ask for permission, and even the SS must tread carefully within his reach. Reinhard Gillen, also known as Adrian Clement Fox, is a secretive man, a quality that does go very well with his role. Had it not been so, he would have been long since dead. With cunning and skill, Gimmon rose through the ranks of the Abwehr, uh, making important allies and equally important enemies. But no friends. It's difficult being friends with someone who holds enough evidence against you to send you to concentration camps for the rest of your life. Among the countless agencies working under him, one stands out. One uh, he has taken a slight bit of attachment to. 
Uh, Gerald Wessler, uh, known as the field agent as Agent Vyderitz Kachkin. He is a capable officer hailing from the Weimar and has been Gitler's protege for almost a decade. Ever since, he discovered his ability to analyze a large amount of complex data and quickly devising plans and countermeasures. While not the best field agent, something which can uh, tries every day to change, Wesson possesses both competence and loyalty, a rare combination of qualities these days. In the world of shadows, the one who rules over them is in charge, and in the Reich, all shadows, be they large or slim, gray or pitch black, spare their allegiance to aging Klanner Flux and bloody Ferdinand. The so-called monster in the uniform of the Weimar Field Marshal Ferdinand Stroner has made a name for himself during the Second World War as a talented strategist and brutal commander, leading troops in the invasion of both Poland and the Soviet Union. Despite this, while glory is in the uh, in this war is heaped upon himself, as Erman Rolling, Hans Spediel, and even Hermann Göring himself, the Field Marshal's name is, as it's known today, is not looked upon favorably within wider bureaucratic circles. Ever ambitious, Goiner desired nothing less than to be the head of the entire Weimark itself. Though a brilliant military man, his skill was not enough. His genes of emotion were dashed against the rocks of reality by the cataclysmic performance during the Western Winter War of the 1950s. Considering a failure by many and generally despised by both subordinates and superiors alike, Schoener was nonetheless forged a path as an influential leader of the Reich's uh, militarist faction. It is considered by uh, to be Hermann Göring's number one man. To the likes of Heinz Beetle, who he despises, his clique is little more than a psychotic band of saber uh, rattlers. To Schoener and his followers, however, they are the saviors of the decaying and dying German. A noble band of warriors demanding great power for the Weimark, an increasing sphere of German influence in Europe and beyond. Shadow ministers and thickening flames. Foreman sat there looking at a letter. He scanned it over, that bumbling buffoon. Foreman knew someone who was in a weak position when he saw one. No law of loss, however. After folding the letter along the creases, he slid the sheet of paper back into the envelope. Borman, with an envelope in hand, slowly walked towards the burning fireplace crackling by the start of the room. As the shadows of his fingers flickered in front of the fireplace, it had given him an idea. Goring wanted to get away from the puppeteers, the fool that he was. Borman was going to bet that those shadow masters would no doubt wish to see his little letter be he had. He turned back towards his desk and sat down once more, letter in hand. Picking up the phone, Borman said to his secretary, Could you put Field Marshal Skolner on the line? Of course. What should I tell him the reason for your call? Tell him I have something that would interest him greatly. So basically, we're throwing Goring under the bus. That's fine. You know, if Goring needs to be uh, thrown under the bus for me to secure power in the Reich, so be it. So be it. Okay. In remembrance of a hero. Today, as it does every year on the most sort of days, the Reich mourns the death of one of the most compassionate and creative visionaries of film media, Paul Joseph Goebbels. In the summer of 1956, our most beloved of directors and pioneers of the National Socialist Revolution had met its end in an untamed wilderness of the eastern frontier. Uh, Presko, specifically, uh, while on his way to visit his close compatriot, Wolf Heinrich Hoydolf, uh, since then there has been a hole in the hearts of any German film critic, or really any sensible one across the Reich, as well as any well-meaning National Socialist. This year's services were no different than the of years past, with some words from the Führer in memory of his old friend, followed by words from several of his closest friends and confidants. Albert Speer spoke of the man's high level headedness in times of panic, and while figures such as Hermann Goring spoke of the fiery passion for National Socialism. Between all those uh, making statements on their own friend, however, none spoke more passionately than the, than the man in his rhetoric of Wolf Heinrich Holdorf. An unknown in the political scene of the party, though certainly in a passionate National Socialist. Featuring several battalions worth of honored guards as part of the services, and several hours worth of eulogies and shared memories, the service finally came to an end. With tension beginning to boil within German politics, the service is now a strong reminder for people in the Reich uh, as to just how short a life can be. Even still, perhaps it is too late for such a lesson. Goring strolled off at his office with a sigh. His gambit had failed. He was wedded to the Meltress for now. The letter to his successor was leaked and Skorner uh, came calling about his betrayal. Goring had lied to him, the conservatives had sent the letter without his knowledge, and set up a meeting. By a stroke of luck, Schoener believed him, but Goring knew that Newman wouldn't. It wasn't as if he didn't try explaining to the Reich's minister how the militarists had done on his behalf. After all they had been through, Goring had thought there would be some more quotable last uh, words on either side, but Newman didn't even manage to finish the sentence before hanging up on Goring in aspiration and disbelief. In one phone call, his conservative support had died. As he strolled through Karnal's Hall's art section, one painter caught his eye. It was one of Napoleon. He was uh, sinking into his chair, defeated. There was no commanding gaze, no passionate look, just a blank stare towards nothingness. Initially, 
Uh, it was there as a matter of pride. Nowadays, who, after all, was the master of Europe? The Führer was not French, let alone one called Napoleon. However, now Goring looked at the painting with a new sense of empathy. If Schoener and his war plans were successful, then he would no doubt go down in history as one greater than Napoleon. But Goring knew deep down inside that he was no Napoleon. Even with the greatness of the Reich and later war plans, it would be near impossible to achieve. On that day, as he would, his armies falter and his uh, people groan. He wondered if someone would even make a painting of him. But I think that at least for right now, you know, let's at least get into April. And then we'll, uh, <laughs> then we'll, let's at least get through one month, okay? One month per episode. I feel like that is something we could achieve. But I feel that at least for right now, we'll, okay, we'll read this one event and then we'll, uh, we'll end off the episode. Felix had never seen such a great city of Germania fall into such disarray. Then for all his years of the Reich as a foreign diplomat had feeling felt this worry about his country. With Hitler away, one could feel the immense pressure weighing down on the citizens of Germania. Crime rate increased, everyone was taken sides, even a military was fractured. And it was if Hitler's condition left his body and plagued the entire city. No matter. Felix received his orders and believed it would be his last when he read the destination, the Burgundian Embassy. He hated Burgundy. Each time he passed the embassy, there would be two people present at most. Burgundy liked to keep things secret and provide only the minimum amount of staff needed to get the job done. And the few diplomats were skilled. Uh, they would only respond in short phrases, and if you pushed them to say more, you would be glared at. Such was the nature of the shadow state, Felix pondered. Felix walked down slowly towards the Volkshaw, towards the Burgundian embassy, but the question placed in his thoughts. Why does he need to talk to Burgundians? What could he expect from them? The tension in the city was pressing on him, and his body began to churn as he saw the door. Germany was failing, and Burgundy knew it. He would be killed if he... Uh, would he be killed if he went in there? Would he die in the office with a giant Himmler portrait under the black banner? Even if he needed to speak with the diplomat, Felix realized that he shouldn't uh, get a response. There must be something big developing between Germany and the Shadow State. The door was in reach now. All Felix could do was open it. Nothing. The large door that once housed the Burgundian embassy was empty, clean, and only the walls remained. This was planned, Felix thought. Burgundy left the burning country to die, and they would not be coming back. But I think that at least with that, it's going to be a good time here to end the episode. So if you enjoyed it, thumbs up. Now, enjoy some down. If you want to see more, subscribe, and goodbye.